When we left the last episode, Charles Elliott, the British Superintendent of Trade, had handed over 20,000 chests of opium to Lin Zichu, who was Governor General of China's Guangdong province, which included the port city of Guangzhou. Lin had the opium destroyed and was up for promotion by his emperor. There were British who wanted war. They pamphleted in the United Kingdom about resisting mistreatment, insult or humiliation, or even slaughter. At times, they focused on the fact that Chinese considered foreigners to be barbarians. The British most definitely did not think of themselves as barbarians and wanted to teach the Chinese a lesson. The opium merchants paid for content to be published in London to stir up public support. The content went beyond the immediate issues and began to cast China in negative terms. They wrote of stagnation of an embalmed mummy wrapped in silk. Back in Asia, on the morning of September 4, 1839, Charles Elliot led three small ships from Hong Kong Island across the narrow water towards Kowloon on the mainland. There were some Chinese junks there blocking British access to food and water. Elliot dispatched Karl Gutzlaff, a German missionary who spoke Chinese fluently and who had been in high demand by foreign traders as a translator. Gutzlaff handed letters from Elliot to the authorities in Kowloon, warning them to withdraw their ships or that violence would result. The Chinese representatives declined to take them because Chinese law did not allow any direct communication between the governments. The British could only communicate through the Hong merchants of Guangzhou. When no movement was seen, Elliot sent a further warning and again asked to buy provisions. When that deadline came and went, he ordered his side to open fire. The Chinese ships fired back and did not retreat. It took some hours and included the firing of grape shot at the Chinese crew, but the British won the day. Lin allowed some of the ships, including Elliot's, to return to Macau, and correspondence was exchanged. Lin also allowed Kowloon traders to supply the British, albeit at a bit higher price, and the signs threatening poison by the drinking wells disappeared. An outstanding issue was Lin wanting all foreign traders to sign a bond, promising to never bring opium back to China on pain of death. Elliot offered a compromise. China could inspect any incoming ships and confiscate any opium. On the issue of the Chinese man that one or more British sailors had killed, Elliot offered $2,000 towards the search for Lin Weishi's killer. Americans were already trading again with China because American traders had signed a less onerous version of the bond, one they say mentioned no death penalty. So they were shuttling cargo between Chinese and British merchants. But then a British ship, the Thomas Coots, arrived from Singapore with only legal cargo. It proceeded past Elliot, signed Lin's bond, and did trade. Lin felt strengthened and ended any compromises. He insisted again on the bond, which he said was much easier than the inspections proposed by Elliot. British ships were close to Guangzhou waiting for a resolution. Lin brought out his warships and fire rafts. This was November 1839. What happened next is disputed. Here is Elliot's version. Elliot claimed that he tried to send a letter to Qing Admiral Guan Tian Pei, but the Admiral refused to take it and asked for delivery of Lin Weishi's murderer. Captain Smith, who had brought two warships from India that summer, thought the risk of leaving the merchant ships exposed to Lin's vessels was too great and that retreat would be too dishonorable. He recommended a battle and Elliot concurred. One Chinese ship exploded, three were sunk, and several others were obviously waterlogged. The Chinese admiral's conduct was worthy of his station, manifesting a resolution of behavior honorably enhanced by the hopelessness of his efforts. In less than three quarters of an hour, he and the remainder of his squadron were retiring in great distress to their former anchorage. It was not Captain Smith's disposition to continue protracted hostilities and discontinued fire and set sail for Macau. One light injury to a British sailor was sustained. And here's the Chinese version, as per a memo by Lin to the Emperor. When a second British ship seemed keen to sign the bond that the Thomas Coots had just agreed to, the British blocked her and forced her back. Just when Admiral Guan began making inquiries, the British opened fire. The Admiral returned fire and ordered his fleet to advance, standing erect before the mast, wielding a sword and yelling, Death to deserters! He did not flinch when a cannonball took off part of his mast, 
and returned fire such that the figurehead of a British ship fell into the sea and many foreign sailors with it. The British ships then fled the scene. Outstanding, wrote the emperor in vermilion ink in the margin of that document. Back in London, China was not the only matter occupying the British Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston's time. This was the period when Britain unsuccessfully invaded Afghanistan to block Russia. The Whig government had also experienced violence in the streets because it refused the Chartist proposal for full male suffrage, secret ballots, the abolition of property requirements to be a member of parliament, and other democratic reforms. The Whigs had pursued some democratic improvements in 1832 with the Reform Act, but even so, by the time of the Opium War, only 20% of British men, and no women, had the right to vote. It was not until around 1885 that even 50% of British men could vote in elections. British government at the time of the Opium War was elected only by property-owning men. If that wasn't enough, there were also rebellions in Jamaica, Ireland, and Canada in 1839. And a minor strike in Wales in November 1839 resulted in over 20 deaths and 50 injured. Desire for war with China was by no means unanimous. Lord Auckland in Calcutta, the Governor General of India, thought there were better commercial opportunities in India. And John Hobhouse, President of the Board of Control in London, agreed and recommended writing off the two million compensation for the seized opium and being done with the drug trade altogether. When William Jardine, an opium merchant from Macau, traveled to London, Lord Palmerston would not meet with him. When they finally did meet, Palmerston was non-committal, but tried to extract as much information as possible from Jardine. When Cabinet did consider the question, they spent most of that meeting talking about the Egyptian leader's attempt to take Syria. That was a more pressing matter for the British. Britain was far more interested in the response of the other European powers to its moves. And when China was discussed, Palmerston minimized the number of vessels that would be required and said six would be sufficient. The main question by the other cabinet ministers related to the cost of the campaign. When Lord Palmerston said that the Chinese would pay for it, opposition decreased. Nevertheless, the Prime Minister deferred a decision and delegated it to Lord Auckland, Governor General of India. But in early November, Lord Palmerston instructed Lord Auckland to prepare forces, but to wait until the spring trading season had ended in 1840. Palmerston did that in spite of the Prime Minister's deferral, and although Parliament had not been consulted and had not authorized such a move. Palmerston's order seems to have even been kept a secret in the Foreign Office. But naval activities could be observed. As word trickled out about the ship's fitting and their movements, many questions arose. Palmerston deferred questions about China for months, and eventually the Tories attacked the plan in Parliament, but did not have the majority. Some Whigs seemed to have defected on the question, as the government's majority decreased on that vote. When the fleet arrived, it bypassed Guangzhou. That may be why Lin dismissed it as rumors to the emperor and described it as a large smuggling operation. This was about half a year after the previous battle by Hong Kong. On July 2nd, 1840, the fleet was heading north, up the Chinese coast, and approached Xiamen Island. We have a map of these locations on our website. You can find a link in the show notes to this episode. The British fleet was carrying a letter from Lord Palmerston outlining his demands to China. The letter was long, and it accused the Chinese of ignoring their own law against opium for so long that it was like a dead letter, and accused them of double standards. China was said to have not prosecuted Chinese officials and merchants who profited off the opium trade and who had encouraged and transported it, but China was now going after foreigners. The letter said that the British Queen wants her subjects to follow the laws of other countries where they trade, but that Britain expects that the laws will be applied equally both to the Chinese as to the British. It demanded compensation if the commandeered opium could not be returned. It further accused the Chinese of mistreatment of the British with a blockade and imprisonment that they experienced in the factories of Guangzhou. It said that as a result, Britain would have to have use of an island off the mainland where its people could reside. It also required an ending to the Canton system and payment of outstanding debts by Hong merchants. The full text of Lord Palmerston's letter can be found on our website, and there is a link in the show notes. At Xiamen, one of the fleet's translators was sent to try to get someone to receive the letter of demand sent by Palmerston. 
He was greeted by unfriendly noises, shouting, and eventually an arrow. He returned to his ship. Again, there are conflicting reports about what came next. The British say they fired two and a half hours of broadsides. The governor general there claimed a British warship was sunk. Two days later, on July 4th, 1840, the British fleet was further north. They approached Zhou Shan, an island off the coast of Ningbo, midway up the Chinese coast and about 100 kilometers south of Shanghai. That is considerably north of Guangzhou and Hong Kong. At first, the locals were optimistic. They thought traders had come there because they were shut out of Guangzhou. The Zhou Shan residents were interested in foreign trade and the profits that trade with the British would bring. But this was no merchant fleet. It was 22 warships and 27 transports carrying 3,600 infantry. Captain Fletcher and Lord Jocelyn were sent to transmit Lord Palmerston's letter to them and to demand surrender within six hours. The Admiral responded that the British dispute was with Guangdong. Those are the people you should make war on. We see your strength and know that opposition will be madness, but we will perform our duty even if we fall doing so. The Chinese fortified the embankments as best they could and prepared. The next morning, the British prepared their fleet, but waited to fire in the hope of surrender. But by mid-afternoon, seeing no surrender, they opened fire for nine minutes. Then they stopped, and the damage was tremendous. The Admiral's leg was missing, and he would die a few days later. People could be seen fleeing. The infantry landed and took up positions with their artillery. The remaining inhabitants had run away, and the governor had drowned himself. By the next morning, the British flag was flying on the island. All in all, about one million people deserted the island, sometimes halfway through a cup of tea or the smoking of a pipe. No British injuries or death were reported then, but ultimately the occupation of that island was very costly. Disease, particularly malaria and dysentery, was the long-term issue. Over 5,300 soldiers were ultimately hospitalized, which is more than their original infantry force, and there were about 450 British deaths there from disease. Why did it only take nine minutes of firing, plus the landing of the soldiers? The Qing dynasty had not upgraded its firepower in the last century or two. Its soldiers mostly had bows, swords, and shields. What muskets they had were old matchlock models that required loading of gunpowder in the muzzle with a slow smoldering match. The British were using flintlocks, or breech-loading percussion locks. Both were superior weapons. Qing cannons also lacked sighting devices or the ability to swivel. Their cannons were also left out in the elements, which caused them to rust. And their gunpowder, too, was of low quality. The British fleet, they'd been continually improving based on experience competing with and fighting the French, Spanish, and Dutch navies. The British ships were self-contained fighting vessels and could carry up to 120 cannons each. The Chinese ships were auxiliaries, meant to support the land-based fortifications. At most, they had 10 cannons. They could not maneuver well, except in smooth waters. The Qing thought that their forts were very strong. They had high and thick walls and held up to 60 cannons each. However, they had no roofs to protect their soldiers and were designed to defend by sea, not to stop an attack from land. And their state of repair was generally weak. In theory, the Qing army had 800,000 soldiers. That absolutely dwarfed anything the British could muster there. But most were stationed for domestic duties, such as suppressing bandits and rebels and guarding prisons. The Qing army had different quality of soldiers. At the top were, were the Manchu, Mongolian, and Han bannermen. Over time, the Manchus predominated among the bannermen. They were hereditary soldiers and received a stipend of cash, rice, and land. The stipend levels had been set at the beginning of the Qing period and had not kept pace with inflation. Soldiers protested, went on strike, ran away, or took another job. Beneath the bannermen was the Chinese Green Standard Army. They were also professional soldiers, primarily ethnically Han, and there were about three times as many of them as the bannermen. Their wages were also diminished by inflation, and they also were experiencing morale and logistical problems. The official number of soldiers didn't match reality. Families concealed deaths and invented births to keep the stipends coming. Corruption by officials was also a problem. 
superiors could pilfer funds and squeeze subordinates with the promise of promotion. Another failure was in reporting. There seemed to be no benefit or incentive for Qing officials to send accurate reports to the emperor. They repeatedly misled him by minimizing risks and problems and exaggerating their contributions. Who was this Dao Guang Emperor? He lived from 1782 to 1850 and ruled from 1820 to 1850. He had smoked opium as a youth and even composed poetry about it. But his views had changed and by the time of the Opium War, he was strongly against the vice. Rumor has it that he even had one of his sons executed for failure to give up opium. Opium already had a long history in China. It seems to have been introduced by the 8th century because it was already mentioned in Chinese medicine texts. It was considered a remedy for diarrhea, dysentery, arthritis, diabetes, malaria, chronic coughs, and more. By the 1100s, it was also being used for recreational purposes. It was popular among emperors of the Ming Dynasty and was considered by them, among other things, to be an aphrodisiac. Initially, opium was not a profitable trade for the East India Company. But by the 1820s, fortunes were being made by entrepreneurs like Jardine and Matheson. The foreign ships would generally sail to Linton, about one-third of the distance between Hong Kong and Guangzhou, and then transfer their cargo onto small local boats. They were rowed by about 20 to 70 Chinese who would unload the cargo and then transport it surreptitiously into China. There was lots of work for locals in the process of unloading and transporting. And then the opium would go inland, and there would be further employment in opium dens, brothels, etc. This, of course, required officials to look the other way, and take bribes for the commerce to pass their areas of control. Often there would be a show of following the law, such as waiting for the foreign vessel to unload its cargo, and then having Chinese ships pursue it so that credit could be claimed for having scared it away. By the time of the Opium Wars, opium was already being produced in multiple regions of China. It was, however, at that point considered an inferior substitute to foreign opium. It would earn Chinese farmers about 10 times more than rice. In 1840, 34 peasants in Shijiang fought officials sent to destroy their crops. American traders did very well too. Families that had grown wealthy through opium trading were deeply involved at Harvard, and others founded Yale University's infamous Skull and Bone Society. Columbia's Lowe Memorial Library was named after a key member of an opium trading family. Princeton's first large benefactor funded his contribution through the opium trade, and even the 20th century U.S. President, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had a connection. FDR's Delano side of the family had earned wealth through the drug trade. Now returning to the Opium War. Over the next two years, the Emperor did send 51,000 soldiers to help with the campaign against the British. But poor communications by his officials, as well as slow transportation, meant that these soldiers were rarely where they were needed. The British controlled the initiative with their mobility up and down the coast. The British could muster ships from India in about 30 to 40 days. But in China, mail normally took 30 to 35 days one way, with the most urgent mail arriving in 16 to 20 days. Travel by soldiers could take two to three months. Now in July 1840, eight days after taking the island of Zhoushan, Charles Elliot and his admiral went across the narrow waters to Zhenhai on the mainland opposite Zhoushan. At first, a Chinese official received the letter from Lord Palmerston, but the next day returned it and said he did not dare forward it to Beijing. So the British tried to get closer to the Emperor to communicate their demands and sailed to Tianjin, the closest port to the capital. That seems to have always been the plan, since that destination is specifically mentioned in Lord Palmerston's letter. What reports was the Emperor receiving? In July 1840, he had received a report from Lin in Guangzhou dated June, stating that some additional British ships had arrived in Macau, but not to worry, they were probably traitors. Lin also claimed to have sunk 36 vessels and killed countless Englishmen. I couldn't be more delighted, was the Emperor's note in Vermilion Inc. on the dispatch. But there's no evidence that any such Chinese victory happened. That was a strange report. Lin is considered a Chinese hero now. He was an upright and incorruptible official. He showed fortitude and good tactics in cracking down on opium and in destroying 20,000 chests of it. It's easy to understand how he might have misinterpreted the new ships arriving in Macau when he was at Guangzhou. But what is more difficult to understand is how he could claim to the emperor having sunk 
36 vessels if no such thing occurred. Seems to have been very dangerous boasting to the emperor at a time when he needed to understand what was actually happening along the coast. Three days later, on July 20th, 1840, the emperor received a message that three to 4,000 English had taken Joshan Island. The emperor was furious and fired the officials there. Two days later, the emperor ordered coastal defenses strengthened against these profit-seeking opium smugglers. He doesn't appear to have realized they were British warships. By July 26th, he was confident that reinforcements would be able to retake the island. Why wouldn't he? He had not been informed that Britain was at war. He didn't know the British Navy was there. He had only been informed of traitors. And he had been told that Lynn had sunk 36 British ships. On August 3rd, he was informed by a memo from Guangzhou, dated July 3rd, so sent by regular and not by express post, that more ships had arrived and might travel to Zhou Shan and then on to Tianjin. So the emperor sent words to his officials in Tianjin that if the British there were obedient in behavior and speech, to tell them the trade only occurs at Guangzhou and not on the north. If they were unruly, they were to be exterminated in battle. The emperor seems to have believed they were just a larger and more aggressive trading group and that their ambitions were simply to trade. Then the emperor received a report from Xiamen and Zhenhai, each about an attempt by the British to deliver a letter. The emperor told his representative Qi Shan at Tianjin that if the British just wanted to hand over a letter, to receive it and to forward it, regardless of what language it was written in. Lin, meanwhile, was sending further dispatches, minimizing the risk. He wrote that these foreign ships only have confidence in open waters and on the high seas. In a river mouth, they can at once be captured and destroyed. On August 11, 1840, the British fleet approached the port near Tianjin. Administrators in satin boots walked into the mud and received Palmerston's letter and probably wanted to prevent the British from coming further. The letter was sent on to Qi Shan, who was the province's governor general. He was a Manchu Marquis, around 50 years old, and had been governor general of multiple provinces. But he had also been fired from two governorships by this point. But each time, again and again, he was saved personally by the emperor. He had accumulated considerable wealth, too. His estate was said to contain 10 million silver dollars and 340 houses. A year later, it was confiscated by the emperor, once he had lost confidence in Qishan. But again and again, Qishan seems to have benefited from his Manchu status and pedigree. Qishan was uncertain whether to pass the letter along to the emperor. While he considered it, he treated the British as his guests and sent them bullocks, sheep, and poultry. Four days later, on August 15, 1840, he informed them he would send the letter along, but that a response would take time. On August 19th, the Emperor did receive and read Lord Palmerston's letters and demands. He says he gave it a careful reading, but he glossed over the demands for monetary compensation, opening of ports and consular rights, and instead focused on the criticisms of Lin and Lin's behavior in Guangzhou. The emperor concluded that the issue was a quarrel with one of his officials. He thought getting rid of the official would get rid of the problem. He ordered an investigation into the complaints against Lin, but ignored the other concerns in the letter. Generally, the imperial playbook when responding to rebellion was either to soothe or exterminate. At this moment, the emperor chose to soothe because as he wrote, the British were like whales or crocodiles with no fixed abode. Even if the Qing improved their defenses along the coast, they could not annihilate them. What was the point in exhausting the treasury then? If they wanted to trade and to have their grievances addressed, that provided an opportunity for resolution. So, as per the Emperor's wishes, Qi Shan decided to soothe the British by providing them with many gifts, compliments, and kind words. Not just for Elliot. Even the ordinary sailors were being banqueted in smaller tents with beef, mutton, bird's nest soup, and other dishes. Qi Shan admitted that Lin had misbehaved, but otherwise made no promises. He did mention that His Imperial Majesty had already resolved to send a commissioner to Guangzhou. The generosity and good manners seems to have stalled Elliot, who didn't think it right to press the matter further, and decided to return to Guangzhou. The Emperor was pleased that the fleet had left Tianjin, and thought the flattery and food to have been well worth the trouble. He then appointed Qi Shan as Lin's successor in Guangzhou. That would be a much more challenging assignment, as he would be responsible for the follow-up. Also problematically for Qi Shan, 
During his report, he had told the Emperor that the British seemed to be showing remorse and that if the British were to attack by land, they would be able to do nothing except fire their guns. So now two Qing officials responsible for Guangzhou in a row minimized the British strengths and abilities to the Emperor. At that point, it was perhaps understandable by Qi Shan, since he hadn't seen the foreigners fight, but they had already captured an island that contained perhaps a million people. So these boasts seem reckless. On October 23rd, the emperor received a request from the governor general of two coastal provinces, requesting 150,000 ounces of silver to cover future military operations along the coast. What for was the emperor's reply. He believed that the foreigners had been respectful and submissive in Tianjin. He expected now that his great minister would sort the matter out in Guangzhou, and then the armies could be demobilized. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Chinese Revolution.